Hi, I'm Dr. Larry Foster, and uh, I'm uh, going to be talking with you on Gospel Tangents. Violin Music by Becca Greenouch. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. There are three groups who came out of New York in the 19th century with very unusual marriage practices. Mormons, Shakers, and the Oneida community. We're going to talk about these three groups with Dr. Larry Foster. He's written an awesome book called Religion and Sexuality, that's, and this book is actually used at BYU as a textbook, as we'll find out in the conversation. So it's a really interesting book and talks about these three groups, and we'll find out how they are similar and how they are different, and they do have some big differences, especially with regards to marriage. So check out our conversation. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents. I have an awesome guest all the way from Georgia. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I'm, I'm Larry Foster, Dr. Larry Foster. Uh, I'm a professor at Georgia Tech um, and uh, sort of an oddball at Georgia Tech because I'm probably the only professor who teaches regularly courses in religion <laughs> at Georgia <laughs> Tech. So, uh, and people also wonder why a non-Mormon like myself would be, uh, uh, have spent, you know, uh, at least four decades, uh, more than that, really, of uh, studying the Latter-day Saints without, you know, Mormons say, without converting. You know, why not convert? Or, or uh, non-Mormons say, why, why don't, you must know all the dirt. Why aren't you an anti-Mormon? So, uh, so I've, I've actually written a couple of uh, scholarly articles explaining that. And I'll try to explain some of that to you today. That, that was like. my first question, was why would a non-Mormon be so interested in Mormonism? Yeah, well, it's sort of a back a backdoor route. Uh, so I went to a very uh, liberal and uh, experimental college, Antioch College in Southern Ohio okay. in the late 1960s, which was a very turbulent period, as I think most of you remember, uh, uh, Vietnam War protests, civil rights protests, uh, other sorts of things going on. And um, I was, uh, I thought I was fairly liberal when I went to uh, Antioch, but I decided I was the last living conservative on earth when I, I was at, at Antioch. But, um, but, um, I, when I was um, working on my, uh, getting ready to do my uh, undergraduate uh, thesis in history, I decided to try and see if there were any other periods in history when there had been uh, similar sorts of tensions and confusions. I'd seen lots of people experimenting with alternative communal arrangements and read about them and visited different places. And I'm, my hobby is to just visit new and alternative religious groups and see what they're like and so forth. So um, I wondered if there was any other period when things were as turbulent and how they had handled them. And I discovered there was a period uh, that was very similar to the 1960s. Surprisingly, it was before the American Civil War in the 1830s and 1840s, and especially in New York State. New York State was sort of the California of, uh, of that period. Uh, and. Uh, Almost anything you could find in present-day California, you could find in New York State in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, you know, it has a hotbed of all sorts of religious and political and social experimentation. Uh, and um, so I decided to look at three, uh, two groups in that area that was sometimes called the burned over district because there's so much revivalistic fervor burning over the area repeatedly. Uh, so I took two groups that I thought were polar opposites, the Shakers, who were a celibate Protestant semi-monastic group that, that basically prohibited uh, sexual intercourse among its members and lived in uh, separate communities apart from the rest of the um, society. Um, and the Oneida community in central New York State, which um, developed a system of complex marriage uh, in which they argued that all adult members of the community were heterosexually married to each other and could have uh, exchanged sexual partners with a, within a very complex uh, a system of uh, controls that they actually had to, to make sure that they didn't, nobody got too excited about any one person and they didn't uh, form exclusive relations. And it looked like here's the two opposite, complete opposites. The Shakers are celibate, the Oneida community is, is, is Says go to it for everybody and um, polyamorous. Would that be the way? They no, I wouldn't know? call it that. No, it's it's much more controlled than polyamorous. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, I should. This brings me to another point. These were religious groups. They were f f 
start, first and foremost, they were religious groups. They put in the, in the alternative marital and sexual practices afterwards. But what I found with these two groups was I felt that they were really very similar in many ways. Um, in fact, the uh, founder of the Oneida community, who, with their system that they, one journalist described as an apparently, com apparently um, unprecedented combination of polygamy and polyandry with certain religious and social restraints, that this, John Humphrey Noyes, the founder of this group, had been influenced by the Shakers. In a lot of ways, his ideas were similar to the Shakers, except he felt that the Shakers had, had missed the boat, that they should have had sex. They both believed uh, in, in polar opposites. Uh, one was excluding all sex, following the idea that they were modeled on the heavenly pattern, whether it be no marriage or being given in marriage. And John Humphrey Noyes was saying, oh, well, uh, he's a Yale-trained academic. Well, what does this passage say? It doesn't say anything about sex in the afterlife. He says, no marriage. What's marriage? Marriage is an exclusive relationship in which the man is viewed as owning his wife. And there's, this is not going to exist in the afterlife. But what I found was that there really, Noyes actually was very interested in the Shakers. He said they were the only other group other than his that even approached the heavenly model. Oh, really? And, uh, and he had Shakers over at the Oneida community to visit, and they performed some of their stylized dances on the stage at Oneida, and he talked, had long, serious conversations with a Shaker elder that his son remembered. He said his father never, it was always very superior to everybody else, but this was a guy he treated as his equal. <laughs> so, uh, and what I found, my argument there for, as an undergraduate was that um, both of these groups in different ways were trying to enlarge the family. In the case of the Shakers, they did away with sex, but they kept men and women living within uh, the same dormitory type situations, but with strict separations with separate entrances and exits and a lot of oversight and so forth. And uh, with the Oneida community, which is, people think is a free love group, they had a lot of restrictions, uh, including um, uh, very uh, uh, regular criticism sessions to make sure people were behaving the way they were supposed to be behaving and how, and trying to help people um, become better adjusted to the community, and um, a, a very complicated system of birth control that I, I can go into, but I won't uh, unless uh, you're interested. But anyhow, the upshot is, I was wondering, why is it that, uh, that this is happening at this particular time? Why are many people trying to join new religious movements that are also very concerned about uh, and millennial religious movements that believed that the kingdom of heaven was imminent, that it was going to happen very soon. Um, and uh, and uh, how did they, why did they get interested in these alternate sexual practices? Uh, the stereotype, of course, is that the, in the 19th century, everybody it was very straight-laced and Victorian. That's not true for the 1830s and 1840s. The 1830s and 1840s was a period that was wide open. It was much more like the 1960s where people were experimenting. The, the society was, um, it was rapidly growing. And New York State was the most rapidly growing part of the country in 1830s uh, because of the Erie Canal, which had been completed in 1825. And a tremendous number of people were pouring into New York State, all sorts of people from different parts of New England and elsewhere. And uh, so there were all sorts of people with different religious backgrounds who were uh, often quite intense about that. And, um, and uh, by 1850, I believe it's correct, that uh, more tonnage of goods were being transported to the east over the Erie Canal than through the entire Mississippi Valley wow. river system. Wow. So this was, uh, New York was, you know, like, as I say, like California today. It was, it was where everybody was going, where everybody was passing through at least. And, um, and uh, the result was that there were just all sorts of different people competing with each other on different, starting different new religious movements, like uh, the Shakers got their, had their headquarters in uh, near Albany, New York, uh, and, um, and spread out into New England and then out into the Midwest. Um, and the Oneida community also started in a nearby area of New England in Vermont, Putney, Vermont, and then moved to central New York, 
at Oneida, near, between Syracuse and U Utica. Um, and um, so I was just very interested in why this was happening. And then after I finished that undergraduate thesis, I, um, I, I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago. So I, um, so I, I, I went to this conference, uh, anthropology conference, because I always like to go to all sorts of different, uh, outside of history, I'm not, you know, I'm interested in all sorts of other topics too. And uh, one of the talks was on the Mormon family by um, a non-Mormon, Mel Hammerberg, who um, gave a talk in which he argued that the, um, the, Mormon fa the Mormon religion was in many ways fundamentally about the family in a way that was much more uh, intense than, um, than uh, other religious groups, all of whom, of course, do deal with the family and have some concerns about the family. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it, almost the family was deified. I mean, uh, it extended into the afterlife and was, uh, went on for eternity, and uh, relationships were continued for af in the afterlife and so forth. And so at the end of that um, presentation, I said, well, you know, I've just been studying these two other groups from the same period, roughly the same location in New York State. Um, and uh, they both were introducing alternative marital practices, celibacy and group marriage, at the same time that the Mormons were beginning to introduce a form of polygamy secretly at first um, in uh, Illinois later on uh, uh, in the 1840s. And um, I said, uh, do you have any idea why so many people were that concerned about the family that they would actually join groups that had alternative systems and, and stay with them for a period of time? And he said, I have the slightest idea. So, so I decided that was my, my challenge. Um, and um, then as a, I, had, I had taken a detour in graduate school, um, but I was back in American history by this time. And, um, and uh, my advisor was Martin Marty, who's influential religious studies scholar, and um, the, one of those go-to people that they like to get pithy quotes for from uh, on the, uh, for uh, television and, and uh, news medium. And uh, so I, I decided to do a attempt to try and come up with a conclusion about a, a, a preliminary ideas about why polygamy was started. Why, why did Joseph Smith start polygamy? And um, I put together about a 50-page seminar paper on this, and I, I came up with a very interesting line of argument. I, I've, I argued that there were basically four different approaches to uh, trying to figure out why polygamy started. One was a standard non-Mormon approach. You know, Joseph Smith was just oversexed, and he was using this as a, a ploy to uh, have relations with lots of women and, and so forth, and that, and that doesn't really work quite well, if you look at it closely, but uh, and then there was the uh, a, 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 a splinter group, a, a breakaway group, really, from the Utah Mormon group that went west with Brigham Young, um, for, then called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now called the Community of Christ, and um, they actually were led for their first 50 years by Joseph Smith's son and and his mother. It, it, the mother was Emma wife of Joseph Smith, who hated polygamy, and she taught her children to hate polygamy, and so they, they had a, a strong anti-polygamy basis and argued that their father had never had anything to do with polygamy. It was just uh, something that Brigham Young had corrupted the church with. And, uh, as, as, uh, this, uh, and then there was another argument that, of course, the mainstream Mormons would say, well, we don't know why. why. God wanted him to introduce polygamy, but he was commanded to do so by God, and he was just, just trying to follow God's inscrutable commands. And then, the, the, uh, then there was another group of psychologists that would say, well, he's uh, psychologically disturbed, and probably you know, something was wrong with him psychologically. And everybody, I said, argued, seemed to hold one of these four points of view and think that that explained everything, and they couldn't see any merit in any of the other points of view. <laughs> And so um, uh, I decided to try and put together uh, a, um, an effort to explain Joseph Smith in a way that different people from these divergent points of view could, could find um, convincing, hopefully. And um, you know, none of these worked completely, but all of them had something to, soft, to offer. For example, 
It shows us Smith surely did have a strong sex drive, but lots of men have strong sex drives. So why, why did he decide to do, go to polygamy? There's lots of easier ways to have sex than just to marry women and actually take some sort of responsibility for them uh, and, uh, and so forth. So, and he also didn't start polygamy systematically until 1841, which is about 10 years after he started the Mormon church. So it was a rather long wait time if he was just using it to rationalize his own um, sexual desires. And similarly with the, um, with the reorganized church, I was able to, um, to show that absolutely, I think quite definitively, that Joseph Smith clearly was involved with introducing polygamy on, and practicing it on a fairly large scale himself. And interestingly, he got about 30 of his closest male followers to become polygamous. But the general Mormons didn't know about it at this time, so it was a really controversial issue. Um, but the people who say that Joseph Smith didn't wasn't responsible for polygamy, have one slight thing in their favor, and that is it was, it was Brigham Young who made it actually work and kept it from dying out. Um, because um, under Joseph Smith, at most, maybe 100 or 200 people closest to Joseph Smith, with his permission, were practicing some form of polygamy. And Brigham, Secretly. Brigham expanded it to and, but, 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 but yes, but after Joseph, so after Joseph Smith died, and only 30 or so men, give or take a few, um, were actually practicing it with his authorization. But after Brigham Young took over the Mormon church, between the 18 months between Joseph Smith's uh, a murder in, eight, in, in June of, of 1844 and the departure west, um, the beginning of the departure west uh, to um, what became Utah, the Great Salt Lake area, um, under Brigham Young, um, there was a, about a tenfold increase in the number of people who were authorized by sealing and uh, other things that it's a little hard to explain to non-Mormons um, uh, to um, have more than one wife. And part of that, I have to say, is because they were they knew they were moving. They wanted to have every, make sure everybody was somehow connected with everybody else and taken care of, and especially unattached women or, or, or this sort of thing. They, they wanted to make sure that they all had some sort of a, a connection during the very difficult move west. But nevertheless, this was it, without Brigham Young. Brigham Young and the other people in the uh, uh, Quorum of the Twelve Apostles uh, that were connected with him, uh, were the ones that really made, sh made sure that it actually continued, and then they institutionalized it in Utah. It wasn't until 1852 that they publicly announced it, five years after they had moved out to Utah. And then there was a big controversy for the next 30, 40 years, 40 years really, till, um, till um, uh, more than 40 years, until um, the, manifesto. the manifesto in 1890 um, began to uh, put uh, brakes on it. Um, but um, anyhow, so, so that, that there's something about that. It wasn't, Joseph Smith wasn't as, he wasn't totally responsible for it. It was these other people that were also involved with it that, that made it work. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. And similarly, uh, the argument by the mainstream LDS uh, people that um, just God told him to do it, and he was just sort of mechanically trying to follow the will of God, even if he didn't know why God was wanting him to do it. It still doesn't really show a good understanding of how Joseph Smith's process of revelation worked. Um, typically, he would get revelation in answer to a question that he would raise or put into his mind, depending on how you want to think about it. And when he had a strong sense of what the correct answer was, he would deliver it as a revelation he had of God, from God. And so the question is, why did he ask God about polygamy? Uh, and uh, that raises a lot of other interesting, complex questions. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Larry Foster. In our next conversation, we'll tackle the idea that some people have that Joseph Smith had to be mentally deranged in order to participate in polygamy. What does Dr. Foster think of that argument? But you have to ask, you know, is there an assumption that anybody who would think that they wanted to introduce polygamy 
would automatically have to be mentally disturbed. And, and you know, then you'd have to say, well, all those people in the Bible were mentally disturbed and so forth. And, so forth. You know, and, and I, I don't think that that would hold up. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.